Welcome to the MegaCast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Today, we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance to Michiganders just like you. Let's begin with what's making headlines on our CivicCenterTV.com local news page. Our top story today comes from Mike Wilkinson at Bridge, Michigan, and their coronavirus tracker. On Tuesday, the state reported 7,390 cases and 54 confirmed COVID-related deaths over the past week, both of which have trended downward from the week before, following five weeks of rising infections statewide. Hospitalization numbers, however, are a bit of a mystery at this time, with metrics backed up due to the holiday, marking the last report or last update on the report being December 28th, where 1,397 people were hospitalized due to COVID-19, the most in Michigan since February of 2022. Updated hospitalization numbers are expected to be released, however, sometime today. Also making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page from Frank Witzel at the Detroit Free Press. Men, uh, maybe not the kind of news you want to hear kick, kicking off the new year as your trip to the gas station this week. Maybe a little bit pricier. AAA is reporting that the state's average price per gallon of gasoline has risen to $3.20 per gallon. Despite the $0.21 cent per gallon jump, prices are still lower at this time than they were a month ago, but up, of course, from this time in 2022. The culprits, a rise in crude oil prices, as well as the holiday season rush for gasoline as people were traveling across the state and across the country to visit their family, both of which rose the demand for gasoline and, and, crude, and other crude oil products, as well as lowering the supply. Simple economics come into factor there. Michigan's average per gallon price remains two cents lower than the national average, currently sitting at $3.22 per gallon. The most expensive gas prices on average across the state, Metro Detroit, and Saginaw at $3.21 per gallon, Ann Arbor at $3.20 per gallon. The least expensive gas prices in Michigan, if you're in the Oakland County area where we originate a broadcast, you'll have to do a little bit of traveling to get access to those. Benton Harbor at $3.15 per gallon on average. Jackson, a little bit higher at $3.17, and then a slight increase from there in Traverse City, where the average gas price is currently at $3.18 per gallon. Also a factor in the rising prices are Michigan's gas tax, a total of uh, which has risen a total of 1.4 cents per gallon from last year. Finally, making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page from Kim Kozlowski at the Detroit News. According to substance use research led by the University of Michigan and other research organizations across the U.S., nicotine vaping has become the most common method of substance use among young people. Over the past four years, nicotine vaping has surpassed both alcohol and cannabis consumption amongst eighth grade aged kids. In 2021, both alcohol and vaping were tied in the ranks amongst 10th grade aged students with vaping surpassing alcohol in 2022 amongst kids in this same age group. According to one of the lead researchers since the study began to be conducted, in 1975, this is the first time that nicotine vaping has led other forms of substance use, both amongst eighth grade and 10th grade aged kids that, uh, that this particular study covers. Vaping first became a measured metric amongst these age groups in 2017. There's been a lot, uh, quite a lot of controversy in recent years over vaping in Michigan with former state Chief Medical Executive Dr. Joan A. Caldoun previously declaring a public health emergency in 2019 over vaping and issuing a statewide ban of sales of flavored vape products due to their alleged appeal to children. A court of claims judge issued a preliminary injunction to stop this banishment, claiming that there was, quote, no genuine emergency, in close quote, and that a business called a clean cigarette would suffer, quote, a unique loss to its business and to its branding, and closed quote, if emergency rules were enforced, and that an Upper Peninsula vape shop would suffer, quote, unquote, irreparable harm if the owner said he would lose his entire business uh, from this particular ban. The Monitoring the Future study is funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. All those headlines today make news on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page. You click on the headline or you click on the thumbnail picture just off 
uh, below that to, uh, to the slight left of the page. And it will take you to this full article, each of these full articles, and all of our articles that we post from across different news organizations and link to, my apologies, from other news organizations across the state of Michigan each and every day throughout the week. So you can read more details. And of course, there's, uh, there's supporting materials that are often linked in these full articles that we're summarizing here on the, at the beginning of our programs. And of course, while you're there, while you're clicking through these articles and reading more details or just getting what we post uh, of the articles on our website, we highly encourage you, if you have the means to do so, to subscribe to these publications and support journalism on your local level. We have a great show ahead on this Wednesday edition of the Megacast. Coming up next, we'll have our first mental health talk with, of 2023 with Carrie Craywick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic, who joins us each and every week. That's up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Watch Civic Center TV with our brand new live captions. To turn on live captions, go to civiccentertv.com and click Watch Live. In your web browser, click on the Options tab in the top right and find the Accessibilities tab. Then just switch on live captions to heighten your enjoyment of our local programming. Thank you so much for watching Civic Center TV. To ring in the new year, the West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce welcomes the 2023 Board of Directors. Don't miss this opportunity to network with and congratulate the movers and shakers of our community. Show your appreciation and more. With the whole event officiated by Judge Diane D'Agostini. Register at westbloomfieldchamber.com. Entry is $20 for non-members and $10 for members. We'll see you January 13th. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about our program on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find links to all of our partnering stations across the Great Lakes State, including our a co-flagship my michigan tv and find all of our full programs and each individual interview from every one of our shows dating back to march of 2020 on demand as well the website again civiccentertv.com slash megacast joining us now on the program as she does each and every week usually on a thursday this time around on a wednesday to talk about a variety of different mental health subjects uh, that, that we are focusing on at certain times of the year or just across the board is Carrie Craywick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. Carrie, thanks for being with us today. Good morning, happy new year. Happy new year to you as well. It's uh, it's beginning of a new year. And with that, a lot of people uh, begin the year focusing on new goals or new year's resolutions as many will make. Uh, but it, it's common that those new goals or resolutions can fall through quite quickly. In, in fact, there, there's a, a phenomenon known as Quitter's Day, which is usually marked as the second Friday in the month of January, where it's common for a lot of these particular, particularly New Year's resolutions to go to the wayside, to fall through, and frankly, to be given up on. So first off, what are some of the differences between setting a, a long-term goal necessarily versus a New Year's resolution? And you know, how do we disseminate between which one of the, how do we decipher between which ones are effective and which ones maybe aren't effective? Sure, well, the research really supports that people who set like vague, broad goals are most likely to fail them. And often when we hear people's resolutions, they sound pretty much the same every year, lose weight, save money. <laughs> you know, it's all these very, very big goals, very big goals that are hard to achieve. Um, something to really do to make it more adaptive would be to take those big goals and then really break down what are the steps that go into achieving it and picking maybe one or two of those one to focus on each month. So if your big goal is lose weight, you may just start with walk daily 
as a goal. And that would be much more likely to be achieved for a number of reasons. One, um, you could track it. You could you could catch yourself every day. Losing weight, something like that might not be the same every day. Things go up and down in our body, whatever happens. And so you may have these ebbs and flows, but if it was something really behavioral that you could do, you could really support and encourage yourself along the way and measure your success that way and you adopting a healthy behavior instead of reaching a big goal, which you're not likely to do in the first two weeks of the year. So then why do we do this? Why do we have a tendency to begin the new year making these New Year's resolutions, setting these big goals that you're not going to accomplish in a couple of weeks, you're not going to accomplish maybe even in that entire calendar year? What is it about just the way that us humans are wired that makes us you know, clean the slate at the beginning of the year? And while doing that and you know, taking the weight off our shoulders from the year before and starting anew as we go into a new year, put all that pressure on ourselves that's frankly unrealistic instead of maybe taking a more measured approach to it, like you said, and setting those smaller goals. You know, I think part of it is so funny that you mentioned this because one of the things you're really talking about is social norms. Now, I don't know the history of resolutions or, you know, where they are in um, terms of certain cultures or religions where it comes to maybe doing something like this. I don't know the origins of re resolutions, but what you touch on is that if there is a social norm about resolutions. So around this time of year, we're talking about it, we're hearing about it, we're seeing commercials about it. Um, so it's sort of all around us that this is sort of a thing we do, yet we haven't really gotten very educated on how to do it and it's it's ironic you mentioned this because there is just some recent research about this that you know one way to achieve a resolution of course is good old-fashioned willpower you know if you say you're not going to do something you want to quit smoking you're just going to quit cold turkey and and that's your plan is not very effective um, compared to having a norm about it so being a part of a community um, being connected with other people having some shared set of rules like hey this is what we do this is what we're doing is actually Actually more likely to achieve success. So they took college professors um, in a classroom and they told their class, you know, they don't want students to be using their cell phones while the lecture is happening. So one, one classroom, they said, um, make your own plan for how you're going to take care of your screen behavior and then attend this class. And in the other class, they said, no screens allowed. We're not doing that here. And in the class, in that class, there was less temptation there was more um, connection, there was more sort of agreement among everybody about what they were doing and how, instead of leaving everybody to their own devices, quite literally devices, um, just didn't work at all. So as people are setting these goals, Carrie, and, and they're putting these, resolu or putting these resolutions, uh, so to speak, together, and, and following your suggestions and suggestions of other professionals and others that are, are used to working with people through achieving some of their goals, what should they be doing and, and what, or what should they be looking for as they're setting those smaller goals to set themselves up for you know, achieving incrementally toward those macro goals, of course, with it being a different situation for each person and the way that they behave in their daily lives? So I think one thing too is, you know, you don't have to start at the start of the year and at any point you want to start, there's a time, but there is like, like you said, there's sort of the pre-planning phase of starting a goal. So um, setting yourself up for success is going to look like, right, what things do you need in place? We've already told you a few things today, making small behavioral goals, um, being able to measure and track them daily, connecting with a group of other like-minded people or like behavior people, um, create, taking the stuff that's tempting out of your home or around your space, you know, so it's like, right, if you're going to give up drinking for January, you're probably going to have to cancel your happy hour plans. Trying to go um, and put yourself in that environment is not going to really be successful. You're going to have to just be really mindful about what you're doing and, and think about that in advance. What, what will I need in terms of people, places, things to support the goal that I've set? Take your big goal come up with some smaller goals. What are the tiny steps to achieve it? Pick one or two to start, follow yourself over the next couple of weeks, and then consider adding another step. Like we said before with the lose weight, start with walking daily. If you're successful through this month, then add something else like removing a you know, certain dietary item or something. Do it, consider once you get successful, adding a, a micro resolution for each month as opposed to one big vague resolution for the year. 
and, and, and so, so often a lot of these goals um, or these New Year's resolutions do surround you know, uh, our health or our bodies or, or superficial reasons. And people want to go and be more active. They want to go to the gym. And I, I heard recently on uh, some clip I had seen somewhere on social media, and it was really an uh, interesting piece of advice that, you know, in, instead of making the goal that I'm going to, you know, work out five times a week, make the goal that I'm simply going to go to the facility, to the, to the gym or, you know, wherever you are going to the park, going out outside or wherever you're going to be doing, uh, going for your fitness regime five times a week. Because if you're there, well, what else am I going to do? I might as well, you know, walk or, or bike on the, walk on a treadmill or bike or, you know, lift some weights for a little bit and test things out, figure out what I'm going to do. And you'll gradually get more comfortable. And it's, and it's so interesting to take that angle because we do see so often that in that second week, that second Friday, which is known as quote unquote quitters day, that these goals that are often, as we have talked about at nauseum today, so far fetched and so big and so lofty and so pressure packed fall apart. What is it about that particular timeline, that second week, you know, two, three weeks into the year or two, three weeks after, in this case, you're setting these goals and they're maybe not working out exactly how you see that, that leads us to throw them away altogether instead of maybe starting over or refocusing them. Sure. I love this idea of, you know, troubleshooting. So when we talk, when I talk about parenting or other different topics, we talk about behavior change, right? When the steps are too big to achieve and then there's failure, we often give up. Really, that's an opportunity to just make the steps smaller, you know, and to take little tinier steps to that next thing. So you're absolutely right. Like, for one person, the motivation to go to the gym may not be the issue, and that step is very easy breezy for them. But for another person, making that a part of their routine is the first step. And if they can do that part, then they add the next teeniest step, you know? So it's like, what, right, what needs to happen in the schedule? What needs to happen in the day? It might need to be troubleshot. So yeah, I think about two weeks what happens is it is a time where our our goals have failed because we didn't plan or tweak them as we needed to. It's really an opportunity to make those tweaks. Okay, what was the next smallest objective I could do under the one I tried because the one I tried was too big and I missed it. Let's try the next smaller one and get some traction there before we add the next layer to, to our goal. Uh, we're joined by Carrie Craywick on today's edition of the Mega Cast, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You can find more information for, uh, and get in contact with the Birmingham Maple Clinic at birminghammaple.com or by calling them 248 646 6659. 248 646 6659 for more information. And, and, and Carrie, how important is it or how big of a factor can it play in achieving some of these goals? whether it be step-by-step step or those macro goals that you're setting at the beginning of the year or any time to involve other people in those steps that you're taking, to be asking for help or just someone that may occasionally check in on you on your goals and you check in on them for theirs. How important can that aspect of help be in getting you from A to Z on these goals? So important, you know, the word we use for that is called accountability. But when we've revealed our goals, we've made ourselves really vulnerable. We've opened someone up into something. There's intimacy there, you know, and that connection is so important. We also feel like we perhaps... We don't want to feel guilt because that guilt can contribute to shame and maybe cause some negative feelings associated with our goals. But when we feel connected and supported, our stress actually goes down. Someone else may be offered to, uh, able to offer some problem solving skills. You know, this thing you tried isn't working. We've tried the same goal every year, save money for however many years and that one's not working. Let's try something different. You know, let's look at it. Sometimes a helpful set of eyes can say, hey, look, I think maybe this might be um, the goal to try for you and, 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 and here's how you can do it. And here's how I can be helpful to you. Um, therapists are certainly exceptionally helpful that way too, to come up with behavior goals, to offer, you know, weekly and routinely checking in, um, to, to really be that supportive voice. If you don't feel like you have someone else who you can trust with that information, um, and certainly addressing any of the underlying causes if we have sort of addictive behavior or avoidant behavior or things that are perhaps interfering with our ability to um, connect with our goals and be successful with our goals, a therapist would really be helpful to um, reveal those things and, and work through them and pass them. 
can get in contact with the professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic and, and involve a therapist maybe and helping you along the way to your goals this year at the Birmingham Maple Clinic's website, birminghammaple.com, or send them an email, info at birminghammaple.com. Call them, 248-646-6659 for more information. Carrie, before we let you go, anything else that uh, you believe would be, in, uh, would be helpful for our audience to consider as they're thinking about their goals, as they're working towards some of their New Year's resolutions for 2023 that we maybe haven't discussed yet today? I sort of mentioned it before, but the research really says that people who set these broad goals are more likely um, to become depressed as a result of not reaching them. And people who are depressed are more likely to set these broad goals. So really, um, the the difference that makes the difference is, is thinking, like we said, moving from the macro goal, take the macro goal, but you can do it different ways, either come up like again with a small daily goal. Um, I can say with certainty, the only New Year's resolution I've ever been successful with was when I decided to start taking the stairs at my workplace. And just taking the stairs daily didn't necessarily yield, you know, weight loss or overall health, but it's certainly a healthy behavior that I said, hey, I'm going to do this every day. And now I do. So that small is what we're talking about to be successful um, and to prevent the incidence of, you know, other contributing mental illnesses as a result. You know, you can really insulate yourself um, from becoming further depressed by just thinking very small daily and actionable steps. Carrie, we appreciate you joining us and uh, giving us some insight into ways that we can better approach maybe our New Year's resolutions or goals that we set throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. BirminghamMaple.com for more information or call them 248-646-6659 to get in contact with Carrie and the other professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. We'll take a break on the mega cast on the other side, a story of a local grandfather who worked to keep his family together and galvanized the local community as well. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the mega cast. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream lives on with United We Walk, an event that celebrates Dr. King Jr.'s birthday by embracing unity, diversity, and acceptance. Volunteer, participate, or donate to bolster your community and engage with your fellow citizens. For more information, scan the QR code on screen or go to unitedwewalk.org. Show your support Sunday, January 15th, 2023, from 1 to 3 p.m. at the new West Bloomfield Middle School. What's happening around you? Hear about state events, businesses, and from the people behind them on The Megacast, an hour-long TV, radio, and streaming show keeping you informed on the day-to-day -day news. Listen in on talks with volunteer groups, documentarians, and financial advisors Monday to Friday with your host, Tyler Keeft. Catch The Megacast weekdays from 10 a.m. to 11 on Civic Center TV, 89.3 Lakes FM, and streaming on MyMyTV.com. Hey, Laker fans, do you know a friend or neighbor that volunteers in Greater West Bloomfield? We would love to help you recognize them at the 51st Annual Michigan Week Awards. Countless members of the communities of Orchard Lake, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and West Bloomfield give their time and talent daily without regard for recognition. You can help recognize these individuals and organizations at our awards breakfast next year on May 12, 2023. Nominate your neighbor or organization starting January 28, 2023. Go to michiganweek.org for details. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find more info on all of our partnering stations across the state, including My Michigan TV, and find all of our programs on demand as well. 
Over 300 charities and nonprofits are listed on the Shared Detroit website. And while we unfortunately weren't able to have Shared Detroit on with us yesterday due to some technical issues on uh, one of their charities, side, we are able to be joined by one today as Thomas Wenzel joins us, the founder of Jamie's Kids. Thomas, thanks for being with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you on. First off, uh, for those that may not be familiar with your organization, tell us about a, a little bit of the history as well as the mission of Jamie's Kids. Okay, well, uh, first of all, Jamie uh, is my daughter who uh, passed away five years ago, uh, shortly after giving birth to her fifth child. And Jamie was an unwed single parent. And um, after a four and a half year battle with the juvenile court system, we finally got the father's parental rights terminated and we adopted all five children. We've had them for five years and ages are, uh, Nina's five now, she was the baby at that time and our little boy Caden is seven and Jenna is nine and Paige is 11 and our oldest Kara, she's 14. And um, we, uh, my wife and I had just uh, retired when um, our daughter Jamie passed away and we live in a two bedroom house. And so to accommodate the, the children, we're in the midst of a addition project on our house, a second floor addition, adding two, uh, two bathrooms and four bedrooms. And uh, we've, uh, some members of our church uh, founded uh, a nonprofit for us called Jamie's Kids, which helped us get donations and volunteers for our project so far. And we do uh, things with uh, veterans, senior citizens, youth sports organizations, and environmental issues. Uh, we, have, we, we sponsor and put on a creek cleanup and rain garden maintenance every year, along with helping senior citizens with summer chores and winter chores and building handicap ramps for veterans and uh, a lot of stuff that we do for the neighborhood and their community. So, so Thomas, for those that are watching on our, our TV outlets, on our streaming outlets, watching even on demand, possibly in the future at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, they look over your shoulder there in, in, in uh, your shot, and they'll see the Falcon logo from Divine Child. And uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I understand that the, the Divine Child community has offered quite a lot of support, too, to uh, you a, a, as well as to the family. Can you tell us about that support and how critical that's been on an A you know, putting this family back together as it currently stands, but also the rest of Jamie's kids and its mission. Right, sure. Yeah, they've been really helpful. You know, um, the main one of the main things is they really helped us out with uh, tuition support. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to, to uh, afford going to Divine Challenge, which is a great school. The faculty and the staff are tremendous. I, I'm a crossing guard there every morning and a lunch monitor every day at lunch. And uh, but uh, their financial support has been tremendous, and their their prayers uh, and their volunteering. They, we we have volunteers from Divine Child coming over to help our, us with our project, you know, weekly. And uh, without them, we couldn't be to where we're at right now. Great, uh, fantastic! The Divine Child community is a fantastic uh, place to be, and we we love being there. It's unbelievable. So speak to also some of the struggles that you went through along this journey to, to put this family together as it currently is uh, in, in, uh, after what happened with Jamie and, and then to overcome that and eventually get to a point where you're helping other people uh, in various ways in the community. Well, before Jamie passed away, my wife and I, we were very active in the community uh, with all those things I mentioned. And uh, when Jamie passed away, obviously losing a daughter a tremendous burden to a family and uh, when the grandparents have to raise the kids that's another burden and you know obviously the obvious one's financial uh, I'm around a forty thousand dollar a year fixed income and uh, without the help of our church our family and our community we couldn't do it like there's a saying it takes a village to raise a child it couldn't be more true in our situation um, you know we, we've we've had the kids in foster care we thought right away we'd just get the kids you know right five years ago and that's not the case uh we had to go through a lot to get to where we are now and to be able to finally adopt them that was our biggest hurdle because at any day we knew that these kids could be taken away from us even though we were the grandparents we still we did not have custody of the children we were strictly foster care parents 
And once we overcame that, once we finally adopted them, that took so much of a weight off our shoulders and allowed us to get back to what we, we, we naturally do is, you know, volunteering uh, for the community and, 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 uh, and help people out. Um, we, we get a lot of help, you know, financially. We, we're, we're back into helping the community out and, and you know, our, our church. Um, one of the biggest hurdles, and it's not a ter terrible thing, is uh, technology. Because five years ago when I retired, six years ago, technology, you could take it or leave it, maybe Facebook or something once in a while. But these kids in school, man, you, you got to know your stuff. You know, I, I asked one a couple of years ago, I asked one of the teachers if they could put a sticky note in the folder and tell me what I need to do with the kids. And they said, oh, no, no, Tom, you go home and go on Google Classroom. And Bill, you said, no, 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 I don't have time for that. Just leave me a sticky note. And they said, no, we don't do sticky notes anymore. So, but we've learned the uh, technology is, is a big, big hurdle. We're still learning a lot about it. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty handy. Uh, once you get the hang of it, I'll tell you, it's very helpful. Yeah, we've seen, you know, especially over the last uh, several years, given the crisis crises we've gone through as communities here in Michigan and across the world during the pandemic, just how useful technology can be to keeping communities together and, oh. and keeping families together uh, as well. We're joined by Thomas Wenzel. He is the founder of Jamie's Kids with us on today's edition of the MegaCast. You can find them in a couple of different places. You go on to Share Detroit's website at sharedetroit.org. Uh, go to the Find the Nonprofit section and search Jamie's Kids, J-A-I-M-E apostrophe S Kids, and you'll find more information on uh, their nonprofit organization. You can also find more info on 324 other charities and nonprofits across the Metro Detroit area. You can find out more about Jamie's Kids by going to their website, jamies5kids.com. That's J-A-I-M-E-S, the number five, kids.com to learn more information. As you talk about the house pro the housing project to you know, uh, get your family into a more adequate space for you know, these five kids and, uh, mm -hmm. and your family, and, and it's making great progress. According to your website, you're about 80% along in that, just about how far away, of, of course, 20%, but define that 20% <laughs> and just how close you are to be, being able to provide this space for this reunited family. It's such a great story and has, has done so much to help so many people in our local area. Well, thank you. Yeah, it, it's been a it's been an adventure. It's the the project's been going on for uh, over two and a half years, and uh, it's uh, basically self funded with donations. Uh, we haven't taken out any loans or anything like that, so we don't owe anybody money. And uh, I, I do a lot of the work myself and my family and friends. And we've had volunteers from uh, the elect electricians union, the carpenters union, the plumbers union, sheet metal workers union. Uh, Bricklayers Union. We've had so many people that that have heard our story, and they get here and they say, "Well, you know, we heard stories before, but once we got here and talked to you guys and heard heard about your story, this is really special. We want to be part of it." And uh, we are. We have the exterior about ninety nine percent done, and the interior. We we got the drywall put up. We're starting the mudding on the drywall, and I'm doing a lot of that. I, I, I retired as a union plaster and drywall finisher, so I've got a little, a little handle on that. Um, but um, we, oh, my thing fell, <laughs> my eagle, my, my falcon. But anyway, um, yeah, we're, we're right now, we're at, at a part right now where we've had some family and friends that are helping us out. We've got a, uh, uh, your organization, but I'll tell you, the more I learn about it, the more impressed I am about Share Detroit. Yeah, I, I, I look at it every day and what a great job that, you, that they do. And it's like, oh, it's so helpful. And you know, I, I just hope that I can, you know, become a little part of this and this cog, this big cog in this big machine. But um, we are there right now, we've had some friends that hook us up with a registry and everything can be found on jamies5kids.com. Um, we're we're going to be ready for uh, paint hopefully in a couple weeks, and we've got we didn't, we didn't anticipate it, but we we found out that a major cost is coming up in all your finished products. You know your bathtubs and sinks and toilets and flooring and window treatment and doors, and so we're at that point right now, and we are we're looking halfway decent. We're hopefully by Easter we're going to be uh, done with the project, and I. I have a little analogy I use is our project is like a uh, 
a big eight cylinder engine in a hundred gallon tank of gas. And two and a half years ago, this thing was a full tank of gas and this engine was roaring, roaring. And then, you know, after a couple of months, we got down to 50 gallons and it's roaring, going good. And then 25 starts slowing down and 10 gallons and five gallons starts sputtering a little bit. And then someone comes along and they dump 10 gallons of gas in there and the engine starts going again. And so it, it, we look forward to everyone coming over. We, it's a joy to have people over. It's, it's such a blessing uh, that, you know, our community, our church and our family and friends have come through for us. It's, um, it's, it's truly amazing. People come here, they they say, wow, I, you know, I, heard, I thought it was a nice thing, but once they get here and they, they see, meet the children, meet our family and friends there, they, they say, well, I want to come back and help some more. It's really so Thomas, you, you've talked about a little bit earlier, touched on how some of the people in the community, some of the contractors that have come in and have either volunteered their time or even donated their time to uh, and their expert expertise to help with these housing projects. They said, they, you know, they've, they've heard about it, but then going in and meeting you and meeting the family and speaking to them, it's really changed their whole perspective on the situation. Just speak to how this story and then these efforts have grown over the years since you began this project and uh, work to do what you're doing right now to uh, help support this family. Yeah, you know, this project, it's obviously, it's, it's a needed project. It's, it's something that we need, but it brings so many people together. It, it brought, our, you know, our, our, my little community around these several blocks together. It brought our whole city together. Uh, the building trades industry, it, it, they, it brought them together. Uh, it's just, just been a, such a nice thing. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very heartwarming. And when they, when you hear about our story, how these, these children were left, you know, orphans and the, the struggle we had to get custody, final custody, and then the adoption process and the people that have helped us all along the way. It's just, it's, it's just so overwhelming. And the, the blessings we've had have, have been tremendous. I mean, I, I could write a book about how many, all the blessings that we've had, uh, me and my family and our, and our, our, our community, we have the things that happened to us. It's, it's so, so amazing. And it's, it is, it's, it's something that, it brings a smile on my face and people come over here and I, I, I tell you, tell them, me and my wife and the kids, thank you for coming. Thank you. And they say, no, no, thanks for having us. You know, we're honored to be a part of this project. And that's, that's kind of cool. That, that brings me kind of a little tear to our eye. Well, Thomas, we appreciate you joining us and, and telling us more about Jamie's kids. And of course you can find more information on uh, Jamie's kids at the website, jamies5kids.org or by going to sharedetroit.org as well. Sharedetroit.org would be the place to go uh, to find information on uh, Jamie's Kids and over 300 other charities and nonprofits. And again, I messed up that website. That's jamies5kids.com. J-A-I-M-E-S, the number five, kids.com for more information and sharedetroit.org as well. We'll take a break on the mega cast. Coming up next, Dave Dulio from Oakland University will join us to talk about all of the things that are happening in the world of politics as we kick off 2023. And boy, are we already uh, in quite a whirlwind in just the first week of the new calendar year. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Watch Civic Center TV with our brand new live captions. To turn on live captions, go to civiccentertv.com and click Watch Live. In your web browser, click on the Options tab in the top right and find the Accessibilities tab. Then just switch on live captions to heighten your enjoyment of our local programming. Thank you so much for watching Civic Center TV. To ring in the new year, the West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce welcomes the 2023 Board of Directors. Don't miss this opportunity to network with and congratulate the movers and shakers of our community. Show your appreciation and more with the whole event officiated by Judge Diane D'Agostini. Register at westbloomfieldchamber.com. Entry is $20 for non-members and $10 for members. We'll see you January 13th. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep 
the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. You can learn more about our program on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find more information on all of our partnering stations across the Great Lakes state, including My Michigan TV, and find all of our full shows and each individual interview segment on demand as well. That website, again, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And of course, we invite you to join us Monday through Friday each and every week live from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. across our network for our live shows. But of course, as we said, civiccentertv.com slash megacast if you're unable to join us live each and every day or stay with us for the entire hour, five days per week. Joining us now on the megacast, as he does each and every week to talk about how the world of politics in the U.S. and the state of Michigan is affecting you, is Dave Dulio from Oakland University, professor of political science and also the director of their Center for Civic Engagement. Dave, Happy New Year and thanks for joining us. Happy New New Year to you too, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate having you on. And uh, no better time than now to have you on as we're already (laughs) off to quite the kickstart to 2023 in Washington, D.C., where uh, the the new Senate has arrived and been sworn in. Not the case in the other House, uh, in the other uh, Chamber of Commerce, in the House of Representatives, where after uh, their first day there yesterday, they are yet to to name a new Speaker of the House. uh, And what is Uh, quite unprecedented over the last century, just the first time in over 100 years that uh, a a vote for the Speaker of the House has gone to a second vote. Now we're looking at potentially today a fourth vote on this. So first off, let's just go from how this is impactful on national politics, because there are certain things that the House of Representatives can't do without the Speaker of the House. Well, and and, and it's a really good point, Tyler. The the and really the house can do nothing until it chooses a speaker um the 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 rules mandate that no member elect is sworn in until the speaker of the house is chosen so there is no functioning house of representatives at the moment the um the speaker has to be chosen and then they will move to swear in all the members even those who are returning uh, like many uh, of our reps here in Michigan, uh, reps, you know, Slotkin, um, uh, Stevens, et cetera, uh, they're not members of the House yet. They have not been sworn in for the 118th Congress, and that can't happen. The, the, the House can't do any business until that is until the Speaker's chosen. Yeah, and it's it seems that the problem here is between like we've seen quite repeatedly over the last year or so during the the midterm elections between some of the establishment Republicans and some of the more uh, Trump Republicans that are referring to themselves as the Freedom Caucus at this time where uh, the Republicans aren't able to get those 218 votes that are needed to put Kevin McCarthy or whomever, whomever else they may eventually put into the speakership given that they have the majority in Congress. And given that these first two votes, uh, first three votes went quite differently, uh, the first two votes having 19 Republicans not voting for uh, for uh, Representative Kevin McCarthy from California, the presumptive uh, nominee for the uh, speakership from the Republican side of the, of the House, uh, first time 19 voted against him. The second time 19 voted against him in, in, in uh, by way of voting for Jim Jordan, a representative from Ohio, someone who nominated previously in that uh, in that session, uh, Representative McCarthy for the position. And now that's at 20. Finally, they they adjourned after that third vote until today. But this could be a big day for Kevin McCarthy, both good and bad, if he's able to galvanize the Republican Party and get himself uh, into that speakership position. Or if this goes to another vote and he doesn't have votes or, or loses even more, this could create quite a lot of chaos to kick off 2023 in the Republican Party and really hamper Congress. So where does McCarthy go from here in terms of what he's got to do to uh, make concessions with, with those 19? Or is this just simply a major power play from the Freedom Caucus to get anybody but McCarthy into that seat? Well, it sure seems like the latter. The, the reporting out of Washington in the last week or so is that McCarthy and his leadership team 
have already uh, made a bunch of concessions to uh, what the Freedom Caucus wants. And it appears that it, it hasn't done any good, right? I mean, you've got, you've got those folks really dug in on, um, on their opposition to, to McCarthy. And you, you wonder what's gonna, what it takes to, to break it, it or if it's just a, um, if it's just a, a, a flex on McCarthy saying, no, we're not doing it. We're, anybody but Kevin, right, is kind of where we're at. And, and you know, is there a, uh, is there a, a consensus candidate that, that is, emerges? Somebody like Steve Scalise who might be able to, uh, you know, placate both sides, if you will, uh, or, or do they look somewhere else? Uh, Jim Jordan, you mentioned, um, very popular among the Freedom Caucus, got got 20 votes in the third round of um, balloting yesterday, uh, but he doesn't want the job. <laughs> you know, so, it, but and that wouldn't be the first time that that uh, you know somebody who who said that they didn't want the job actually got the job. That's how Paul Ryan became speaker um, uh, in the in the early 20 early 2000s. Joined by Dave Dulio on today's edition of the MegaCast, professor of political science at Oakland University and also the director of their Center for Civic Engagement. More information can be found from the Center for Civic Engagement on oakland.edu slash CCE. And so as we're approaching today and this potential vote, uh, fourth vote for the House speakership at 12 noon, this is critical mass for Kevin McCarthy because right now he has, or at least up to this point, He's been in position to be the number one person in the Republican Party, at least in the House of Representatives, and one of the highest ranking Republicans in the entire uh, in the entire union. And if this is the case where they do make concessions where the, to the Freedom Caucus, the majority of the Republicans are making concessions to the Freedom Caucus and don't put Kevin McCarthy into that position. Now, this is the second time this has happened to him, where he's been uh, at this point to potentially take the speakership and ultimately be snuffed out of it and somebody passing him in line. This might be his last shot at it. So what what chance does McCarthy really have to recover from this, given that it's happened before, and given that he has a tendency to make concessions to to uh, to those in political power, that ultimately is also one of the problems that these 19 originally and now 20 Republicans that did not vote in his favor favor really have against him. Yeah, it seems like he's painted himself into a corner, right? And and he. You know what's the way out? He he's given concessions again by by all the reporting that's come out, and it, so where does he go from here? That that those folks aren't changing their mind. It it appears, right? I mean, it will be very interesting to see what happens at noon. So in about an hour, right? What what transpires? There's some I read just before coming on with you that uh, Republicans are going to try to uh, not have a vote right away, uh, and and uh, go into a recess. Well, that that's certainly not bodes that certainly doesn't bode well for McCarthy um you know it's it's one side's going to have to give and and you wonder when other republicans go to McCarthy and say hey look it, it it's not happening right you got to step aside um and then of course the question if that happens the question becomes what uh what what is there to fill that void right who do they who do they put up as i said jordan doesn't want it and he probably couldn't get uh, he probably couldn't get the 218 votes that are needed. Um, so, it, you know, we, we may be at a stalemate again for uh, for an, another day or so until something breaks loose. And this isn't something that's uncommon in American history. It's simply something that we haven't really seen be a problem over the last 100 <clears throat> years. There's been, as you mentioned, situations in the past where, for example, when Paul Ryan rose to the speakership where there was uh, there was some disagreement amongst the Republican Party over who should be in that speakership, and ultimately Ryan, though somewhat reluctantly, rose to that position. But even that didn't go through several votes, uh, several uh, voting processes to then get to that point. This is something we haven't seen literally in a century in the U.S., but it's not uncommon in Congress in congressional history. Yeah, you know, and, and it, it it reflects the. Um... The divisions that are present in the Republican Party, uh, you know, it's it's a, and those divisions exist in the Democratic Party as well. That they, they're just not being, you know, the, the Democrats just haven't laid uh, laid out their dirty laundry like the Republicans have. You know, in in um, 
2019, in January 2019, when Democrats retook the House, there was opposition to Nancy Pelosi. Uh, but what, what many Democrats did is vote present. They didn't vote for a Pelosi rival. And if you vote present, that lowers the number of votes needed to um, to attain the speakership, right? So there were again, there were there were um, some folks who said, "I'm not voting for Pelosi." In fact, when uh, uh, represent our representatives Stevens and Slotkin first campaigned for the House, they pledged not to support Pelosi, uh, and at least one of them voted present um, in that uh, in that speaker election. And and what that did was again it 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 uh, they, they fulfilled their pledge by by not supporting Pelosi. But what it di what it didn't do is uh, stand in the way of Pelosi becoming Speaker. So maybe that maybe that's something that McCarthy can can convince people to do, not vote for somebody else, but just vote present. Um, but even then, you know, uh, his his Democratic opponent, Hakeem Jeffries, the the Democratic leader, has gotten more votes. Uh, because his party stuck together, and and his uh, and the Democrats have all voted for Jeffries, um, which have given him 212 votes more than McCarthy has. So he's still going to have to convince uh, a handful of Republicans who haven't supported him to do so if, if that strategy is going to work. Dave, two minutes left, and, I, and I, uh, until we'll have to say goodbye today. And I do want to bring this up because it was something that uh, caught my ear yesterday as I was flipping through the news channels while this was happening, and. Uh, and I, it was on Fox News that I had heard this, I believe it was Greg, Greg Gutfield, who had said, well, the reason we didn't hear about, we haven't heard about this happening in the past is, is because 100 years ago, we didn't have social media. We didn't have the 24-hour news cycle, and people are trying to make a name for themselves. And it brought up a really interesting question in my mind of how much of this is purely just spectacle? Yeah, I think, uh, in fact, I think a lot of it is. And, and, and you look at the, at the folks who are leading the charge uh, against McCarthy, and this is no endorsement of, of Kevin McCarthy for speaker, but but you look at the Matt Gateses of the world, right, and the Marjorie Taylor Greens, and and the and the other ones, and, and you know what, what's their what's their purpose? Is it to actually improve how the chamber works, or uh, do they have some policy in mind that that they want to um, that they want to see? moved towards or are they just trying to uh do some grandstanding and and help their fundraising for the next time around right i you know i think jim jordan um as we've talked about you know it, the person who nominated mccarthy on the second ballot um used to be a mccarthy opponent now they've they've seemed to to uh be more aligned he gave uh, a a really good speech from the republican perspective on what should happen in uh, in this next Congress? And and it, so my point is, there's a difference between Jordan and the and the other ones, right? Who are uh, maybe just trying to uh, stand in the way of of McCarthy. Um, you know, I, I don't know what they want. I it, it's not clear to to I don't think anybody what their end game is besides stopping Kevin McCarthy from becoming Speaker. Ironically enough, as much as we heard about, hey, let's all take action on the House floor and have these debates on the House floor, a lot of these discussions happening behind closed doors as it happens, tends to happen in both parties. Dave, thank you as always for joining us. You got it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you on. You can find more information from Oakland University and get involved with them and, and how our national politics and local politics are affecting you and your community with the Center for Civic Engagement, oakland.edu slash cce for more information on their events and upcoming discussions all throughout 2023 already off to a hot start on our national politics side that will do it for today's edition of the megacast you can always join us live monday through friday from 10 a.m to 11 a.m and on our website civiccentertv.com slash megacast for more information we thank you for joining us today thanks to our guests and our crew we'll return soon with new episodes